Gotcha. All right, all right. Welcome everybody. Welcome on Zoom. Welcome to everyone that's here. Uh, we we are glad that you've joined us tonight. Uh, certainly, you could have been anywhere, but you're with us, so we're so glad. Um, and this is a program that's brought uh, in conjunction with the Authentic Caribbean Foundation, uh, Antioch College. Uh, we have our we have Jess from Antioch is here. We have uh, we and we have and I know y'all can't y'all can't probably see her yet Zoom, but that's okay. Um, we will get this recorded and then we'll send out the recording. Um, so we just got you know folks represented here. Uh, and, and, and then we have some folks here on Zoom. So I'm gonna ask uh, Andrew Sharp to come up and he's going to share with us uh, for about 10 minutes or so, or whatever time you like, and uh, share with us about the Authentic Caribbean Foundation. Uh, and then we're going to go into slides uh, with uh, Colin and I will present, uh, maybe even question for Q&A. We'll also share, we have, a crew, we have a flood kit with us. So we're gonna demonstrate a flood kit uh, and what a flood kit is. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna ask uh, the founding director of the Authentic Caribbean Foundation, Andrew Sharp, to come on up and share with us who you are and what you do. Thank you so much. Hi guys on Zoom and those who are on Facebook Live. Oh, we're so happy that, and thanks for coming in person. I'm Andrew Sharp, I'm the chairman of the Authentic Caribbean Foundation. Um, being from the island, we always say, are we prepared? Are we truly prepared for a disaster? Um, yes, last week I, I was going through my list and I'm saying, wow, I'm still not 100% prepared, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm like, where's the flashlight? Where are the backups, you know, batteries and so forth? So are we really truly prepared for, um, the climate that is affecting us. We see climate change. If you look in the West Coast, there have been a lot of flooding happening. Um, the rivers are bursting because of overflow, because of excessive rainfall. Um, we've been having so much different weathers from 60 degree one day to 30 degree the other day. And let's not talk about the tropics when we have these crazy hurricanes and crazy weather. Um, we at the Authentic Caribbean Foundation is happy and pleased to partner with CREW um, because we know that our community is affected by this climate change. And it's, it's a community initiative. It has to start from home. How are we planning? How are we preparing ourselves um, is critical and important. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we're so excited to be providing support for our community, especially those here in Boston or Caribbean American community, and especially our vulnerable community, which is persons with disability. Um, we see that they, you know, they, don't, they cannot move around easily, so they're the first one on our list to ensure that they are safe, they have access, and also a relevant information um, for them also to be prepared. All of us has to be prepared. So we're so happy to provide support for our community. Um, we also provide support for the vaccine initiative. And uh, as we move forward in 2022, we know we'll be doing much more outreach on what is required by our community, what you really need to help you prepare and how we can easily get you access to city services and other services that is needed um, for your community. So we're very, very grateful um, as an organization as we grow and also to be in partnership with CREW to highlight the really important aspect of preparation for climate. Um, and also for our leaders in the community. So you might know someone, a church leader, or someone who is there, they should be prepared. They should be a, a, a kit in place, a plan in place, so that if anything happens, um, we know how to, to get our community together. We know where they are, 
and how we can provide such support for our community. So once again, thank you so much um, for believing in us, for following us, um, and also be a part of it, get involved, um, come out and support us. We know that we're going into the winter and a lot of people hibernate, but at least thank God for technology. Look at where we're at now. The pandemic has showed us that we can be in person and also be on Zoom and be on Facebook Live um, to really you know, provide that information right across. So information is not limited now um, because we have the system in place, especially um, <laughs> and um, Facebook so that you could get that information. So reach out to us if you need any assistance, any support that is needed. Um, we're here, authenticcaribbeanfoundation.org. And uh, let's just plan and be prepared. It's, you know, you never know what will happen. Not because we're in the winter, we shouldn't be prepared. Yeah, we do understand in the summer, we have extreme heat, but also in the winter, we have extreme cold and we have the snows and all of that. So are we really prepared for these weathers that are coming? And this is what we're gonna show you today on how to prepare. We're so happy that Vernon is here, who is gonna, and his colleague is gonna do um, a presentation on how you can be prepared. What are some of the stuff that you should have or a list and planning and all of that? Because as my grandmother said, prevention is better than cure. So if we're not prepared, then we're gonna be in some serious problem. So thank you so much guys for coming. Thanks for being here on both Zoom and Facebook Live. And we look forward to continue supporting you as a community. And uh, we're so pleased to have such great partnership with Crew. Thank you so much. And guys, enjoy the rest of the presentation. And I'll hand it over to Vernon. Cloud or something? Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you uh, for bearing with us for technological difficulties. Uh, we also want to thank, thank you so much, Andrew, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you for the Maserat Community Center for hosting us. We appreciate y'all. And um, yeah, so we're going to go a little bit about what crew is. Can we hit the next slide, please? So crew is a program under the Better Future Project. Uh, and the aim of the Better Future Project uh, is a organization that works to build a powerful grassroots movement to address the climate crisis and advance a rapid and responsible transition beyond coal, oil, and gas towards a renewable energy future for all. So there are two programs under the Better Future Project now. If we can go to the next slide, uh, 350 Mass and Crew. For the purposes of our conversation, we will just focus on Crew tonight. Um, time would not allow us to go through the ins and outs of both Crew and 350. Um, and uh, we won't keep we won't keep you long. Someone asked the question, well, how long is too long? Well, I like to say, well, we'll be finished as soon as we're done. Uh, and then when we're done, we'll be finished. Uh, but we want to be respectful for folks' times. Uh, folks have drawn, dr driven a long way to be here, so we want to be respectful and mindful. Uh, so CREW is a young grassroots organization, pro slice program, that aims to build an equitable, inclusive neighborhood climate resilience in New England through hands-on education, service, and planning. Uh, so we've done a lot of workshops uh, across the country, virtually, uh, about how people can prepare for extreme weather in their community. Uh, when we're talking with people from the West Coast, we talk about wildfires. Uh, when we talk with folks down south, Texas, we talk about blood, such as Houston. Uh, so we try to localize our presentations to where we are and who we're talking to. When we talk to New, we're doing a New England presentation tonight. As you'll see, we'll talk about specific weather. Uh, but that's what Crew is. Crew's been around for almost three years. Um, and uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. 
so I'm going to ask Colin to delve into this, and then we'll get into extreme weather. So please take it away, Colin. Um, as part of working on resilience uh, as being an organization that we're sort of thinking about how to build, you know, preparedness for disasters and climate change in our communities. Um, part of this reason we're doing this workshop today um, is in uh, response to we're part of a team that's working with the uh, Climate Resilience Toolkit, which is the U.S. federal government sort of doing this at like the whole national level, thinking about how to build resilience and uh, how to help people plan for disaster um, and think about the impacts of climate change in the communities um, on that the broad state and federal level. So they've been compiling a set of tools into, you know, this one, the one toolkit, they have a lot of case studies, different kinds of uh, digital mapping uh, tools, uh, mathematical tools. Um, and so I can go to the next slide here. Um, we are part of a team right now working with Antioch University and EC Farms, other organizations, to uh, think about this toolkit projection there um, and sort of what its use is in terms of the work that we're doing at the community level, because we're a grassroots organization. And a lot of these resources are focused on planners at the federal and state level and people who are already engaged in the planning work. Um, and so it's less accessible to people who are not um, already part of sort of the federal ecosystem of resilience planners and disaster planners. Um, so we're part of this team. Uh, Jess is also here from Antioch University. Um, thinking about how we can make the toolkit more accessible and more relevant to um, everyday people who, you know, because there's a lot, of, a lot of material in it, a lot of maps and case studies, connections to expertise. You can you know, connect to climate scientists around the country, but it's not easy to sift through um, if you're not uh, someone who's already familiar with what's, you know, what the contents are. Um, so we're part of these uh, workshops is where we have experience as an organization delivering, you know, talks about resilience and, you know, planning locally or personally, um, but thinking about how that kind of, this kind of workshop can, you know, be integrated into the more federal uh, planning and be accessible more broadly than just uh, through these one-off workshops. All right. Um, what are the, what impacts of climate change can we expect to see in New England? Uh, there may be one or two persons wants to take a guess of what type of what type of uh, what type of extreme weather do we deal with here? <laughs> what did you say? Cold, cold. Yes. All, all of the above. <laughs> yes. um, can we go to the next slide? So uh, one thing that was left out was heat. Uh, but this map here uh, shows how we are expected to, how many days of heat we're expected to experience. Uh, so from, 20, from 1971 to 2000, uh, we saw that the New England area, uh, and this is for a, a summer that is 90 days. Uh, summer in New England is considered uh, June to August. Uh, so between that time period of 1971 to 2000, we see that there were 11 days of temperature over 90 degrees. So even though maybe some of the folks can't see at the bottom what some of those shaded boxes mean, so that from 1971 to 2000, that really red box on number 11 means over 100 degrees, but those other boxes, they meet, they, they're over 90 degrees. So from 2015 to 2044, which is the time frame that we are living in, we're expected to see uh, 31 days of temperature over 90 degrees. Uh, that's, uh, of course, depends on a lot of tipping points on how much climate change is left to be unchecked. Uh, and while crew focuses on adaptation, uh, it is important that we do mitigation as well. And, and we really are thankful for organizations like 350, Sierra Club, Sunrise, so many other organizations that are doing mitigation work. Uh, because mitigation uh, is also goes hand in hand with adaptation. 
uh, because we know that we will ex be expected to experience this extreme heat. Uh, and even uh, 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 because uh, the climate change has been getting intensely worse over the last 150 years from the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and if, you, if you'll notice that there, there's a graph, and I didn't bring that graph with me, but the last 150 years correlates to the burning of fossil fuels, coal, and gas, and we see a kind of spike in temperature. Uh, so we know, and the UN released a report in August of this year that said that sea level will continue to rise to 2050, no matter what we do, uh, and we will continue to experience hot, hotter summers. Um, 20, uh, 2055 to 2084, we're expected to see at the worst of the worst, um, and this is Boston and the greater Boston area, um, so I should clarify, uh, over 60 days of 90 degree temperatures. So what we should understand is that when there are heat waves, people that are most vulnerable, people that have underlying conditions, cardiac conditions, little kids, older folks, uh, they are more susceptible to experiencing heat strokes, fatalities, uh, uh, heat exhaustion, et cetera. Um, can we hit the next slide, please? It is interesting uh, that, uh, in the na according to the National Weather Service, that heat is the most is the is the is the temperature that kills the most amount of people. Uh, so if you look at my yellow chart, not my yellow chart, but their yellow chart, if you look at their yellow, their bar graph, the yellow bar, that's 138 people per year have died since uh, from 1991 to 2020. If we look at uh, the last uh, 10 years of 2011 and 2020, uh, 94 people have died, and this is this and this is because of heat. Uh, if we look at uh, just 2020 alone in America, 51 people have died because of extreme heat. If we look at lightning, uh, you got to watch out when lightning strikes. Uh, 39 people have died uh, per year because lightning, uh, give me one second, I'm coming there. Uh, you got hit by lightning. Oh, okay, give me one <laughs> second on that. Uh, we have 39 people that die per year. Uh, but let's put a pin on it. There is a question on the floor. I know y'all can't see a Zoom, but y'all can hear us. I'm wondering about the different effects that heat has on society. Um, in addition to like the underlying illness and, and related death, I've looked into some aspects and found that heat really, um, you know, when you're hot, you get bothered and upset and, and frustrated and heat violence and domestic violence actually really increases when heat increases. So mm -hmm. I wonder if that could be kind of wrapped into our thought process about adaptation in terms of social and you know domestic and other factors. If you hold on, we got a slide that addressed it. <laughs> uh, yeah, just hold on, hold on to your seat. We got the American, we're gonna bring the American Psychological Association into this. So you just hold on, just hold on one second. And uh, you give us about 10 minutes and we'll, we'll get there. So we'll put a pin on that question, then we'll circle back because uh, we're going to go through the, psych the, the psychological component of extreme weather. So just give us one second, that's an excellent question. Um, so we see that lightning, uh, we see that light, 24 people died from, 19, from 2011 to 2020 because of lightning per year. Uh, but if you follow me, winter and cold. So 35 people died per year uh, on a 30 year average of because of cold, or because of winter. And then because of cold, 27 people died. Um, on a 30 year average. So we understand and we recognize and realize that extreme weather is dangerous, deadly, and disastrous. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, more rain and more snow. So what climate change does, or what we say climate, or I should refer to as climate chaos, it brings on more warmer air. And warmer air causes more moisture, it holds more moisture, which creates more storm. So when we think of Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Ida, we are looking at a result of climate change. Um, go with me, if you will. So more rain, more snow. Between 1958 and 2016, uh, the top 1%, the top 1% biggest storms, the strongest storms the precipitation increased by 55%. That's where that number comes in, 55. And you can see in different parts of the country, um, and this is the from the National Climate Assessment. So we see 
that the, the 1% biggest storms increased by 55%. Welcome, welcome. Um, and what we have here is uh, we know because more because warmer air holds more moisture, we know that these storms will get stronger and stronger. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so coming back to heat, uh, so urban heat islands is a result. And I'm going to show you a map that it even includes where we are right now. Uh, so neighborhoods, for those who don't know, on our Zoom or who maybe watch this video in the future, uh, neighborhoods with little tree cover, a few grassy areas and a lot of concrete uh, can be as much as 15 to 20 degrees uh, hotter than surrounding areas. Uh, the urban, and this is known as the urban heat island. Welcome, welcome. Uh, this is called the urban, the urban heat island. So to come back to that, neighborhoods that have less trees are more hotter. Neighborhoods that have more trees are more cooler. So on a 90 degree day, temperature day, a neighborhood with a lot of trees can make that 90 degree day feel like an 80 degree day, potentially 75. Uh, and, or 70 rather, uh, 75, 70. And a neighborhood without trees can make that temperature feel like 100, 110 on that 90 degree day. Um, and the heat or the urban heat island effect amplifies the heat waves already oppressive temperatures. Areas with a lot of asphalt buildings and freeways tend to absorb the sun energy that radiate heat. Areas with green space, parks, rivers, tree lined streets absorb less. Can we go to the next slide, please? Let me show you this interesting map. So at that bottom, and this, so this is heat. This is this is the Boston area, Somerville, Kingbridge, where I live, Chelsea. But at the bottom, I don't know if y'all can see that. Um, this says Ashmont. Um, and then there's this other area of Dorchester, which we are. So these are neighborhoods that experience the deepest heat islands. Uh, or experience greatly heat, uh, heat islands in, in the Boston area, Great Boston and Greater Boston. If you look at Brookline and Franklin Park, Franklin Park is the big park in Boston, uh, you'll see that is blue because there's a lot of trees over there. But if you look at Brookline, which is a traditionally upper middle class community, uh, predominantly white, you'll see that it's a lot cooler. And perhaps one way, one, one of the reasons why is because residents understand that trees are important and trees matter. Uh, and and uh, by the way, if anyone has any questions, please do hold them or because we want to get to Q&A. Um, but if you feel like you might forget your question and, and it's a really burning question, please do just interject. Um, but Logan Airport, I know a lot of us know where Logan Airport is. East Boston, and I know Jess was there last week, is a environmental justice community community that has diesel fuel, that has floods a lot, that has urban heat islands. So it's certainly an environmental justice community. Uh, they're trying to put a sub, uh, comp comp um, the company, and I'm trying to, I'm drawing a blank on the name, uh, National Grid, I believe, is trying to pit a substation, which the residents have fought against uh, because substations uh, can explode when it, uh, rains uh, or when it floods, and that's what happened in New York. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Coastal flooding. I wish this was a little more clearer. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe that's the widest lens we can get on the, on the thing, probably. Uh, but coastal flooding here, uh, I'll walk you all through it. So at the bottom, it just says 2030. So I'll read the numbers off at the bottom. So if you can look, you see Boston Common, these are neighborhoods that will flood. And Boston is a city that's in landfill often, a lot. Can we go, can we go to the next slide? Anybody see the difference there? That's 2050. Y'all gonna be blown away by what y'all see in 2070, but <laughs> y'all can see, y'all can see that, that more areas are flooding because sea level is rising. And, and there are certain communities in Boston that might be wiped out. Um, Back, uh, back Bay, Seaport, uh, because these were built on landfill. But the difference is, uh, so for those who might live in Dorchester or know the Dorchester area, 
you know, Marcy Boulevard's floods, Gallivan Boulevard, which is not too far from here. Uh, the difference between when it floods in Back Bay and uh, the seaport is that these are traditionally more uh, white, white, more affluent communities where people can just get up and move, um, where people who live in communities of color uh, can't don't have that luxury. Uh, but we'll get into we'll get into that in a little bit, uh, and, uh, in terms of uh, looking at some numbers. Uh, can we go to 2070, please? I'm gonna let y'all absorb that. So by 2070, we can see that a lot of the city will be grossly flooded grossly underwater. And y'all see Logan Airport all the way up there. That's East Boston right there. Uh, that's Boston Commons right there. Um, and then this is all different parts. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's astronomical. Can we go to the next slide, please? Oh, you want to come back to this slide? Burning questions, burning questions. No, 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 go ahead. When you say underwater, Clarify that. You mean when it rains? Well, like, so uh, not necessarily underwater. Let me clarify. So the, the flooding and the sea level rise. So when these, these areas will get uh, deeply flooded when it rains and when storm water runoff happens. So when the storm happens and then you have all this storm water flooding. So to clarify, uh, but these areas could be potentially underwater if climate change is left unchecked um, and neighborhoods can completely disappear. Uh, but you know, Boston is a city that you know, have a new mayor uh, that got sworn in yesterday who believes in a Green New Deal for the city, Michelle Wu. And she's trying to ensure that we do a lot of carbon cutting of carbon emissions. Uh, but I know just to interject, I know ABC had uh, one of their reporters at the Antarctic and they were looking at how the high ice is being melted. So more ice melt, that means more rise in sea level. Mm -hmm. So that is just predicting. Because when you look at Seaport, when we had that Sandy, how it, the sea level, the water came up and caused so many floods. Mm -hmm. That city, is so true. The city is planning to raise streets and build you know, walls and boroughs that would prevent flooding. But this is without all that would be underwater. But even with you know, work to protect the city from flooding during storms. This is like the level of flooding that still might happen even with sea walls and raising up the uh, infrastructure. And unfortunately, entire cities will be underwater. Miami, Florida, for an example. Uh, you have uh, certain islands and uh, nations that will uh, be deeply impacted. You know, some of y'all might know about the conference in Glasgow. Uh, and nations trying to come up with a deal like Paris Court Part Two about trying to cut this uh, to get this problem under control. It doesn't get worse. Um, but we are already going to see an increase of extreme weather. Um, what we don't talk.
playing on your end, but not on the screen. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes. Can our people on Zoom still see it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Can we do it And we can email this out too if we have trouble with it. This is just a storm in East Boston. So this is some pictures. This is a video clip. Um, this is a snowstorm. Um, Boston, I'm sorry, Seaport. Seaport flooded by ice and storm surge. Uh, we can send that video out, uh, but we can get back to the presentation. Thank you all. Uh, we were at the hurricane slide. Oh, I'll pass that. Okay. Social and psychological impacts. That's what Jess wanted to talk about. And we have we have this ready. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, this is psychological effects. Next slide. Okay, so Hurricane Katrina as a case study. Um, up, up to 55% of adults and 45% of 45% of children suffer depression after a natural disaster. 49% of Hurricane Katrina survivors develop an anxiety or mood disorder. One in six develop traumatic stress disorder. Uh, can you can you hear me? Okay, all right, all right. Uh, outside of the United States, uh, the suicide uh, suicides of 60. Thousand Indian farmers have been, uh, over the past three decades have been directly linked to climate change. Uh, an increase of five degrees Celsius, nine degree Fahrenheit on any given day was linked to, with 335 deaths. Can we go to the next slide, please? And this is some of the stuff we wanted to get into. Okay, so the crumbling community effect. And then we'll get into what crew does about this. And we're almost done, actually. Um, but we've got, we got a couple of raffles. We got two raffles we'll get through. Um, but uh, a raffle for folks here in person to win a $25 gift card. And then we have one for people who took the survey that we'll, we'll do. Um, so after, uh, so let's just get through this here. Uh, the crumbling community effect. Uh, so indirect imp uh, climate impacts or impact. Climate change can affect the way we think about ourselves, each other in the world. Uh, after a climate event resulting in displacement, people may experience a diminished sense of self, difficulty relating to others, uh, diff uh, a difficulty relating to others, diminished social interaction, and nostalgia. So that's a 50 cent word that means the loss of a sense of place, solace, and security tied to one's physical environment. Community impacts include domestic violence, as Jess was saying earlier, because there's a, there's a correlation between when it's high and domestic violence going up, or extreme weather happening, uh, child abuse, violence, assault and civil conflict, economical insecurity and physical damage are potential effects. Uh, but here's the antithesis of that. And this is what crew focuses on. Cooperation, establish social ties and connections with community members. This will help withstand changes and encourage adaptation. Can we go to the next slide? So what does crew do about all this? And, and we've got a few more slides and then we'll, we'll, we'll get on out your way. Um, so we have community teams. We have one in Somerville. Uh, and these are folks who are interested in coming together uh, and getting to know each other, getting to know your neighbors. Um, because what we think, of, how we think of climate resilience at crew is social resilience is climate resilience. So if you're connected with your neighbors, when a heat wave happens, when a flood happens, when a storm happens, if you're connected and you know that your neighbor is, is vulnerable, or if you know that your neighbor is an empty nester, or if you know that your neighbor is uh, lives alone and doesn't have an AC unit in a heat wave, uh, you can check in on your neighbor. Um, we saw this happen in 1995 in Chicago uh, 739 people died because of a heat wave, a five-day heat wave. 
there's a book out called uh, Chicago Heat Wave, Social Autopsy of the Chicago Heat Wave by Eric Klingberg. So he, this, he, was, a, he was a student at a college, UC Berkeley at the time. And he said that, uh, his research said that people in Chicago doing the heat wave that were more connected to their neighbors, they were likely to survive. And 739 people is a lot of people. Uh, in Europe, uh, in Europe, 13,000 people died in France in 2003 because of the heat wave. Um, in Philadelphia, my hometown, uh, folks, uh, 120 people died in 1993 because of heat waves. Uh, so this event you see here is breaking up concrete. So we have we so that so there's a team there's something in Somerville, Massachusetts known as Depaving, a group that depaves called Depave Somerville. And the goal is we know that concrete can absorb the heat and then bounce it back, and it makes it hotter at night. But when you have more pavement or when you have more green space uh, or even bricks, it the community could be a lot cooler during the nighttime and the day. Uh, so this was private property. Is that, you know we don't encourage people to go out and break break up street, streets, actual streets that cars drive on. Uh, folks go to jail, and we don't we we we're not in the bail we're not in the bailing out business yet. Um, well, we might get to the bailing out business, but we're not there yet. Um, uh, so we say no no to jail, no 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 to bail, no jail no bail. Uh, you know so we don't encourage people to go and just take sledgehammers. Uh, but we work in consultation with the group in Somerville. Um, and we have a crew team there. Uh, we are looking to develop that more. But the pandemic has made it tough for people to come together. Uh, even our own team has made it tough for people to connect in person. Uh, and Colin are talking a little bit about, uh, he'll talk about resilience hubs and maybe can share a number as uh, that program has grown astronomically um, during the pandemic. But uh, we, we found out uh, that during our uh, during this pandemic, uh, we, 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 we've had a little difficulty trying to get these teams established. Uh, we have had a lot of people express interest before the pandemic in Arlington, Watertown, Newton. Uh, and we have, we, have, we have a bunch of PDFs on how to get a crew team started. We even have a document that talks about how to start one. And we recently, in the last three or four months, Back in August, I had someone reach out to us from Western Mass that was interested in starting a crew team. I had a couple conversations with her. I connected her with our Somerville team leader, uh, but unfortunately that person just disappeared. So we realized that it's harder kind of to get these teams going. Um, but that is something we're still striving for. Um, and we're gonna go to the next slide and I'm gonna turn it over to Colin to talk about the Resiliency Health Program. Please. The work that we're doing, similar to the building any connections with the resilience hubs program, which is I'm a coordinator of the resilience hubs, which is in sort of contrast to doing like a top-down planning approach where you have local planners, state, you know, state government being the one that is like in charge of contacting everyone and in charge of all the resilience work. Um, this model is the idea of having community organizations, churches and libraries, uh, most commonly, but it can be you know, community centers, people who have physical space in a neighborhood and are just people who are already, you know, going in and out, people already get services there, already know the place. Um, uh, and then engaging with these uh, organizations and by becoming a hub, we just mean they are serving as a site where people are, um, they can either get education and engagement, they're hosting events around preparedness, disaster preparedness, um, or it can actually be like a physical um, relief uh, center we're working on that as well right now. Um, a lot of our sites are already doing work around sheltering people, around providing, you know, off the grid solar phone charging, you know, electric asset access, if the power goes out. Um, they're working to formalize that and increase uh, our hub's capacity to do that work. Um, but this is sort of a model of because um, the people who often know what the local vulnerabilities and the local needs are are people who are already engaged in the community and not sort of like a, a top-down planner who's not as you know connected to the you know people already getting those services. So it um, connects to the 
Right now, this is like for a level one hub, which is like the formal sort of education center, which is hosting uh, educational events and engagement events. Um, in uh, September, we had our climate prep week, which is a week of all of our partners and you know hosts holding these events and you know different kinds of events in person. Um, and that was actually uh, a lot of a lot of turnout for there, um, which was great to see because there has been some burnout, as Vernon mentioned, around the pandemic, especially virtual events. Uh, it's hard to get people uh, engaged as much, um, but having a physical space that can host like physical materials and host events in a garden or outdoors uh, really goes a long way um, to engaging people and getting information and supplies into people's hands. We So we know, we, we talked about floods, um no, there, there is. We talked about floods, we talked about um you know how Boston is going to flood. Uh what we're gonna do is show y'all a resiliency kit. Um we have one in the summer that we give out, so I'm gonna come a little closer to to the to the camera here. Um but before we get into this, before the flood, make an emergency plan. They're gonna they're gonna come up in bullet points so you can just yeah, build an emergency kit. This is an emergency kit. We'll, we'll, we'll do this last. Put electronic and important documents on high sleep uh, shelves. Sign up for Code Red or Alert Boston. Charge devices and backup batteries. Clear gutters, downspouts, and drains. Buy flood insurance. During the flood, evacuate immediately if told to do so. Don't walk or drive through a flooded street. Turn around, don't drown. Listen to the weather radios and emergency notifications on code red. If your building is flooded, get to the highest level or if necessary, the roof. Uh, never climb into a closed attic. Before you go to that one, next slide, before you go there, uh, I'm sure if folks had known this uh, during Noah's flood, maybe more folks would have survived, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, they, didn't, they didn't take heat. Uh, but um, yeah, mm -hmm. did, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, after the flood. Listen to instructions from authorities. Avoid driving unless it's an emergency. Wear heavy boots and gloves outside. Do not touch wet electrical equipment. If it's safe to do so, shut off electricity. Check on your neighbors if it's safe to do so. Um, stay out of flooded waters, no matter how nice they may look to swim in. <laughs> Uh, even if you are from Florida and you like swimming in water, swimming in flooded water is not a good idea. Never use a generator inside, but to, before you go to the next point, because that is the last slide, I think. Um, when we talk about checking on neighbors, we also like mean texting. Um, and uh, we didn't have this document on this screen tonight. We didn't have a document on the screen tonight, but um, there's like a text plan that people can use just to check in on their neighbors. Um, but let me show you a resiliency kit. So I'm going to, because I want our people to see it on Zoom. I'm going to move this chair here. OK, y'all can see me on Zoom. OK. So in, a, in, a, a, so in our kits, so there are book. I'm going to be yeah, yeah. yeah, so in our kits, we, we, we send these to hubs. Uh, if they request one, we normally have our crew crew lo logo book bag. So this is what to do. If you're in a if you already have this, if you already have this built, then you don't need to get ready if you're already ready. Uh, so we have, you know, you want to keep a first aid kit for our folks on Zoom, first aid kit. Uh, this is important, especially during the flood. Can I just hand this to you? And uh, you want to have a waterproof uh, document holder. Um, I feel like an infomercial, but uh, <laughs> you want to have a, a me and Colin like here, it's like infomercial here. But um, we, you want to have a, a document here. This is protect, like you can put passport, birth certificate, social security card. So this is waterproof. I'll hand this over to, to you, Colin. And matter of fact, if you want, you could. And whenever you're ready, whenever you get tired of holding them, 
Uh, we have a can opener, can opener, uh, because if you're going to be stuck for a while. So we want to imagine that you're in a flood, you're in a flood zone area and the whole neighborhood is flooded and it may be a while before 911 gets to you. You want to make sure you have these essentials so that it increases your chances of survivability. So you want to have like canned goods or canned food. Um, I'll pass this over to you. There you go. Uh, we have a seven day pill counter for folks that are on medication. Uh, so you, if you have, if a person has this already ready and they don't have to worry about trying to scramble around, all right, Zoom. We have a feminine hygienic products. Because if you're gonna be stuck for a while uh, and certain things, other things are happening, you might want these hygienic products. We'll pass it over to you. We are, we have a male personal hygienic product. This is the toothbrush, razor, things of that nature. There you go. You don't want to have an extra toothpaste and toothbrush. There you go. All right, all right. We're winding down here. Flashlight, and because if your power is going to be out, you want to make sure you'll be able to see. There you go. Waterproof matches. Uh, Keisha, I'll show you the batteries in a second, but you want to make sure that they're waterproof so that you can keep a light. You want to have an 11 in 1 survival toolkit. This is a one inch knife, a can opener, a wedge nut wrench, a 1.5 inch saw, a two position, a possession, a two position wrench, a lanyard holder, slotted bit, bottle opener, 1.5 inch ruler, four, present, four position, four position wrench, an auxiliary compass. All in one, y'all. There you go, I'm gonna make sure you don't get cut. Okay, there you go. Emergency survival blanket. You want to stay warm. Emergency survival blanket. And it actually opens up when you when you blanket. And finally, say again. Oh yes, that's right, that's right. Finally, and none and, and last but not least, when it's a storm outside. Oh well, before I get to there, you want to have batteries for the flashlight. You want to have batteries, batteries. Oh, this is super duty. Yeah, super. So finally, and rest assuredly, uh, we know that storms are stressful. We know life can be stressful. Hell, going to the dentist can be stressful. Uh, and many things can be stressful in life, uh, particularly trying to survive a flood. So for some people, they deal with stress in many different ways. Uh, and whatever is the best coping method we encourage people to find that, particularly during a storm, during a flood. But uh, we also like to provide people a stress ball, you know, because it is stressful. So you're going to like, you know, need to squeeze something out, you know, squeeze that stress out, you know, work that stress out, get that stress out. And that is what's all in a kit. How often do you have to take that kit? Huh? How often do you have to take that kit? Well, so we, so we have given these out to hubs, and we have, uh, I don't know if Colin mentioned it, but 73. Um, we, we're getting to the point where we're going to get funding to be able to give these out to individuals. Um, actually, uh, starting in May, we're going to be where we we've been blessed to get a certain amount of funding. We're going to be we're going to be giving these out. Uh, I'd like to give that to you, Mr. Dale, if you can. Thank you, sir. All right, no problem. Thank you. Teamwork makes the dream work. All right, I'll, I'll let you work on it. Um, so 
we're getting to the point where we're going to start handing these out to individuals. Um, and uh, we haven't, a lot of folks haven't requested these because at least our hubs yet, because there are a lot of them are remote. Uh, but as we are coming out and more and more people are getting vaccinated, we will look to probably have more things. I think it's a month. You, you should constantly check it monthly. Your, your, um, your stuff, like, for instance, I have a um, first aid kit, so you know, we'll make sure that the uh, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, welcome, Jess. Oh, that's you. Oh, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> all right, all right. Um, and this can be customized any way you like. Whatever, you know, uh, not everyone's on medication. So it could be customized um, however a person likes. Uh, we want to open up for Q&A. Um, yes, and then we have uh, uh, Ali, who is uh, who's from Tufts, is with us. Uh, we're going to do some raffles. Uh, if, if, can everyone sign in that didn't sign in? Because you're going to have a chance to win a $25 gift card. Um, so we just want everyone to sign in. Uh, and then we're going to do a raffle in front of you. And then we're going to do a raffle for the uh, we're going to do a raffle for the for the the the, the people that did the free survey. You, we have everything. You we have everything, Allie. Yes, yeah, so I'm straight for the Okay, no problem. So give this is a pretty high. Yeah, yeah, yeah very high. <laughs> And then what we're going to do is um, we'll take your information down and we can um, we can we can mail you a gift card. So there's a question over here. Movies are out there, and and those grow so much money, and so many viewers are there. But we don't often talk about the reality of the disaster relief, like you just demonstrated, which is so valuable for. A lot of people have it, and so when I wonder if, like, we get Hollywood on the line and say every dystopia movie has to have a disaster kit tailored to your specific locale or something. So, getting Hollywood to to promote the idea of climate adaptation. Yeah. People tend to like, I want to see the movie, but it's so popular. It's like a dystopia movie. Granted, it's pretend, but it's also like if people are interested in that type of stuff, and they're like, oh, that's actually might happen in my neighborhood, but it's flooding, and I need my medicine. Maybe you might be the producer that wants to produce it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let us know. We'll, 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 we'll do that. Yes. Uh, can you talk a little louder? You said 73. Five Brazilian subjects. Yes. Um, what is it? Uh, are there certain types of community organizations? That are like what is the one of the different organizations that are maybe Colin can answer yeah, that? Yeah, sure. Uh, um, no, but I think the most common, but the big majority are libraries and oh, churches. Okay. Are and they might need to hear you. Um, uh, yeah. Zoom. To the Zoom audience as well? Uh, yeah, libraries and churches are, I think, the most uh, common ones we have. We have about 30 of the hubs that are currently um, part of the program joined in this past year uh, part of the AOA, the American Library Association, and sort of a, because libraries are very good at talking to each other as well. Like we have, there's like um, 19 in Dallas, the entire Dallas hub library system is currently. All these hubs are like all across the mm -hmm. Yeah, we have uh, one in Canada even, yeah. Um, it is in Vancouver, um, yeah, Vancouver Island, right now the end city, which is, I believe, where you, you know, you need resilience there. They had the roads all wash out recently. And yeah, so, yeah. There's also, um, I'm thinking about main specific climate impacts and a lot of, you know, tick-borne illnesses. We're mm -hmm. seeing a lot of more tick Lyme disease stuff, and I wonder if that could be somehow incorporated into that toolkit as well, or the yeah, I think it actually is. Um, there is some uh, discussion of, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, tick-borne illnesses in the toolkit. Um, I'm thinking about the, I said toolkit, what are we calling Oh yeah, the, that's the flood kit. Um, okay. also, there's a, we have the heat kit as well, which yeah. is a bit that has more cooling supplies in it. Um, but yeah, with the uh, increased 
warm weather. It's a lot of a lot more tick range. Yes, indeed. Yeah, you have a question. Yeah. How, or a thought. How would one go about catering their survival kit to be um, in a heat uh, heat kit? Or what do we have in the heat kit? Oh, yeah, we have we have a heat kit. The well. heat kit. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, some we of, do. Some of the some of the like same stuff. Yes, yeah, so the question is about the heat kits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so there are twenty one pieces of. Oh, pardon me. There are twenty one pieces of uh, equipment in there. There's uh, there's um, electrolytes. There's water. I should have brought one of them. I was thinking about it. Um, there is thermometers. There's cohesive wrap. Um, there's cool patches, uh, so uh, they're designed for people to have to go out into the heat waves and you know keep them cool, keep them from suffering from heat exhaustion and heat stroke. And not in the kit, but like just water in general. Um, we have water in the house. So just go to the water. So I think there's a couple packs of water. In yeah. It. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not in the bottle, but it's in the. Uh, it's it's the Plastic. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. That's right. That's right. Have you seen it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Um. I think people say like seventy-two hours of water per person, but I also recently heard that actually it's like three weeks of water per person that you should have on hand in your house just in general, which is a lot of water. That water takes up a lot of space. So. <laughs> Uh, so we should do these raffles, yeah, because uh, we have a lot of food that folks want to eat. Um, this is the people here. This is the names of the people. Yeah, people here. Okay, so I'm gonna let you draw. Okay. I'm just gonna shake it up, <laughs> and then what we'll do is we'll write down the person's name, phone number, and email. Name, phone number, email. Well, actually, a person can write their email address. I'm gonna pull somebody's name out. So the winner of the $25 gift card from here today, uh, Sylvan Buckler. Oh, okay, wonderful. If you could, uh, wonderful. If you could here. write your email address, uh, uh, write your contact information. Um, yeah. Oh, <laughs> right, you know what? We can just give the card to you to give to her. Okay. You make sure it gets there. Okay. Um, okay. So, so we'll get we'll we'll get you we'll get you taken care of. Huh? There, no problem. Now we have. Okay, camera. All right. Are we recording? Okay. Um, well, let me let me let me let me. All right. So this is for the ninety plus people that. And then we already kind of have their email and information. All right. You want to draw? All right. We have. Uh, Just stick with one. What is the email? Rob Scoy1999 at gmail.com. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, okay, we have food. If you want some food, or you hang around. I think you got a few more minutes. Uh, we'll run a little over time. But um, thank you, Zoom World, uh, from the crew team, Ali, Colin, myself. Yeah, uh, we appreciate you being here, Michael. We appreciate you being here, Emmanuel. Well, uh, um, we are going to uh, put this recording on YouTube. So can we save the recording? Uh, all right, good to see you. Uh, oh, Abishai, okay. All right, okay, I didn't realize we had that many folks here. Oh, hey, Mike, all right, all right. All right, all right, all right. Good to see you, good to see you. We're glad to see you and glad for your activism. Then we are going to shut the Zoom down.
Have a wonderful night, and we will stay in touch on behalf of the crew team.